Welcome back everybody for this part two of our webinar series. This is the final part of introduction to population grids and their integration with remote sensing data for sustainable development and disaster management. Once again, my name is Brock Blevins, training coordinator for the RSET program, and I'll be your host today. Once again, we are joined by members of the Pop Grid Data Collaborative, which focuses on different population grids and their application to a range of topics related to development planning and monitoring of the SDGs. Just to recap, this is a two-part training, and this is part two. All webinar recordings, the PowerPoint presentations, and now the homework assignment is available on the training webpage, as you see here. Any questions you have, you can direct them to myself, as well as the NASA RSET Gmail account. In order to receive a certificate of completion for this webinar series, you will have to have attended both live webinars and submit the homework assignment by April 27th. This is a Google Form submission. If you do so, you'll receive a certificate of completion approximately three months after the completion of this course from Marinus Martins. Last week in part one, we had a great presentation from Greg Yetman and Stefan Leik on an introduction to the population data grids, their limitations, their strengths, and their uses. Today in part two, we're really happy to dive a little bit deeper into how these population grids can be used in different applications, in particular, sustainable development goals and disaster risk reduction. So first, I'm gonna send this off to Dr. Robert Chen. He is the Director and Senior Research Scientist for CSUN. Thanks, Brock. Uh, I'm Bob Chen. I am, uh, as Brock mentioned, the director of CSUN, which is a center of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. I also am manager of NASA's Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center, one of the 12 distributed active archive centers. Uh, and I also co-chair a group called the Thematic Research Network on Data and Statistics, which is part of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So I'd like to start uh, with just a little bit of history about uh, gridded population data and some of the early applications. Uh, I actually started working uh, with our gridded population of the world data set uh, back in the uh, early 1990s when a geographer named Waldo Tobler came to us with this idea of gridding population um, on a, a five minute long grid uh, to help uh, improve the way people viewed population around the world. Back then, uh, uh, geographic information system technology was just getting started. We, uh, working with Uwe Dijkman, who's also pictured here, uh, pulled together uh, administrative boundaries for about 19,000 units and corresponding populations and created the first version of GPW. The next version of GPW was uh, produced by CSUN and actually one of the first major applications was to help uh, map poverty and wealth. Uh, this was done by Jeff Sachs, who later became the director of the Earth Institute and therefore my boss. Uh, he uh, worked to uh, link uh, the population data with estimates of, of uh, income and wealth and produce this paper that was published in Scientific American. So we have uh, continued to evolve GPW over the years. Uh, the version four was produced uh, for uh, uh, about uh, five, six years ago. And uh, in addition to mapping the distribution of total population, we uh, have made improvements. We've also, of course, increased the resolution and draw on uh, many millions of inputs. Uh, 
but in addition to total population, we disaggregate population by age group and gender. So for example, you can map particular age groups, you can map uh, uh, the difference uh, between males and females and generate a sex ratio as shown here. Uh, in parallel with improving mapping a population uh, it, with GPW, just using better census and boundary data, many groups uh, began thinking about how to model population. And I think this has been discussed uh, more extensively in the previous training session. But uh, just to kind of summarize there uh, from the remote sensing viewpoint, there are a number of data sets uh, that have uh, emerged over the years that have been used to improve the mapping of settlements of, of infrastructure and population. So with Landsat, uh, we had 30 meter resolution data with radar on the order of 12 meters. Uh, and then of course, commercial sources of satellite imagery with three meter or even under one meter resolution. And these allow people to understand where buildings are and associate population with those buildings. And Season has worked with a number of groups. For example, a few years ago, we started working with Facebook. And Facebook was actually interested in uh, trying to think about how to improve internet access in rural areas. And they had found that some of the um, existing data sets, which focus on, on buildings and infrastructure, were doing uh, well or better in urban areas, but didn't do as well at mapping population in rural areas. So they saw the potential for processing very high volumes of, of uh, imagery to do a better mapping in those rural areas. But then as they went along, they also realized how useful those kinds of data could be for applications like uh, vaccination campaigns and other kinds of humanitarian assistance. And they began working with the International Federation of the Red Cross and, uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and uh, posted the data openly on the humanitarian data exchange. So those data are openly available, uh, licensed uh, with a Creative Commons uh, open license. So I think you've already heard a little bit about this, uh, so I'm not gonna go back into it, but because of this proliferation of different data sets, uh, a few years ago, we decided to develop uh, the PopGrid Data Collaborative. And one of the outputs is this website which uh, pulls together documentation in a much more consistent and accessible form for all sorts of different global gridded population data. And I think as you have seen in the previous session, we built a tool that allows you to uh, actually compare data for any particular area you're interested in from the different uh, global scale uh, population data sets. Uh, including uh, highlighting an area with a polygon or circle and uh, getting the estimate of population in that area. So uh, the main part of my talk, I wanted to uh, give you a sense of, of the overall different types of applications of gridded population data. Uh, you'll hear more in the rest of this session from a couple of People have worked in more detail on specific applications. But over the years, CDAC, the NASA Data Center, has collected citations on the use of our data. Uh, we have an online database which has more than 5,000 citations. And actually, uh, over 3,000 of them are citations of the various versions of uh, GPW and uh, the uh, another data set called GRUMP, uh, Global Rural Urban Mapping Project. So, and we also track whether these data are used in the same paper with remote sensing data 
often from NASA satellites, but also other satellites. And about a fourth of those papers uh, cite GPW also use remote sensing data. And uh, we have done on various occasions analyses of these citations. Uh, this is from a few years ago. And this pie chart actually reflects not just GPW, but all the data cited in our database. Uh, but one interesting thing is just the breadth of applications of uh, CDAX data across the sciences, including uh, a lot in, the, in biology and medicine, uh, but also in technology and all sorts of uh, both natural and social and health sciences. Uh, so this just gives you a little taste of the breadth of the types of uses of data, at least in the scientific literature. Uh, so to uh, give a few examples of the variety, I've pulled some from some, some higher profile journals. Uh, these have both appeared uh, in 2020 in science. Our GPW version four uh, is often used to help characterize, of course, proximity of population to different things, in this case, uh, water bodies, rivers, and, and uh, coastal coastlines. An interesting one last year, uh, given the pandemic, was uh, it was used to help distinguish location of seismometers, which were uh, being used to kind of detect the change in human activity uh, that reflected in you know, lower seismic noise during the pandemic because of the reduced movement of people. Uh, this is a paper that appeared in uh, Nature Communications, which uh, was looking in the context of both of uh, natural hazard exposure, in this case floods, and also climate change and looking at vulnerability uh, now, but also uh, into the future based on different scenarios of uh, future climate change. Uh, and then here are a couple applications in the, in the health, public health arena uh, report last year in the Lancet, which actually has higher impact factors than science and nature. But, and in this particular case, it was kind of a, a broader assessment of health and climate change impacts. And what is noticeable is that in several different uh, health hazards, uh, heat wave exposure, wildfire, wildfire exposure, and um, uh, changes in uh, urban green space. The population data is important in, in highlighting those kinds of exposures and vulnerability. Uh, another paper more recently in The Lancet uh, was looking at uh, helminth infections and uh, the notable thing about this is they did use the uh, child uh, estimates, the age structure data that we developed for GPW-4. So we've seen a number of cases for things like air pollution and, and uh, other health uh, issues where age is an important factor and therefore having a better map of the distribution of that age group is useful to those kinds of analyses. So uh, I've, I've focused uh, so far mainly on uh, uses in the scientific literature. Uh, obviously, some of those have practical implications. Uh, but we also see uh, gridded population data being used in essentially uh, online decision support systems. So I think many of you may be familiar with the Global Forest Watch, which is available through um, uh, Google Earth Engine and a number of collaborators. Um, and you will find uh, the global human settlement layer, which combines our data with work by the European Commission Joint Research Center, as well as reservoir and dam data uh, as one of the layers that is available through that interface. Uh, and similarly, there's a, a website uh, developed by the Partnership for Resilience and Preparedness, which again, also brings in population and other layers uh, as uh, an important factor in thinking about climate adaptation and, and resilience. 
uh, a, a operational application of the data is uh, illustrated here in a tool called GeoCollaborate, which has been developed by a private company called Storm Center Communications. Uh, they work with a group called the All Hazards Consortium, which helps utilities respond to extreme events like tropical storms and other, other weather extremes. Um, and in this platform, they don't just show the layer of population if, if a user wants, but if you can see a, there's a little square with population on the bottom left, you can actually pull up a interface to make a request to, to CDAC's population estimation service and in the interface, draw a polygon or, or another shape. And then that retrieves uh, data from our server for exactly the geographic area specified. So that allows any user to kind of figure out, well, how many people are in the path of this hurricane or are under a National Weather Service uh, warning area and uh, that might help uh, first responders and others start to figure out whether uh, how high the risk is and what they might need this is is being implemented now for the national weather service and and other noaa centers that's dave jones pointing at the uh, output that his client returns from our server which again uses gpw as as the uh, source of gridded population data that's summed up to the area that a user wants. Uh, so this is just one example of uh, a different kind of application of our data for educational purposes. Uh, last year, the Guggenheim Museum in New York opened up a large exhibit called Countryside. Uh, unfortunately, it closed within two weeks because of COVID and didn't open up till the fall and then only stayed open until February of this year. Uh, but they had a large interactive display with many data layers. You can see our population density in the bottom left and, and they had a number of NASA remote sensing layers uh, as part of this uh, immersive exhibit. So uh, my Final topic is to uh, discuss uh, really how the population data fits into the larger context of sustainable development. Uh, as many of you know, there were 17 sustainable development goals adopted in 2015 by the international community. Uh, many groups uh, are involved. The one I'm associated with, the SDSN Trends Group, has been helping uh, to bring together different communities focused on the intersection of science and uh, development and statistics. The Group on Earth Observations, which is an intergovernmental voluntary uh, organization, early on did uh, this analysis looking at population distribution and infrastructure mapping in terms of their relationship to the goals. and you know, it was pretty clear that uh, population data, knowing where people are was important to all the goals, not, not to every indicator, but to, to many indicators within the larger set of more than 200 indicators that were identified. Uh, so stemming from that, we actually, or NASA funded a set of projects under the Geo Human Planet Initiative uh, the one I lead has focused on uh, how population and settlement data can help uh, improve uh, uh, estimation of a number of the SDG indicators. Here's a, a list of some of the ones we've focused on um, and uh, try to highlight the issue that countries, in order to develop consistent indicators, uh, need to have potentially population data that is appropriate to the indicators, potentially consistent across the indicators, 
as well as with other countries. And you will hear in a, a subsequent talk uh, some of our more detailed work on uh, 911, the proportion of rural population who live within two kilometers of an all season road. And finally, uh, linked with uh, the Human Planet Initiative under GEO, there is a initiative that NASA also helps lead called uh, Earth Observations for the Sustainable Development Goals. They recently worked with UN Habitat to create this toolkit for sustainable cities and human settlements. Uh, there's, uh, of course, a lot of our CDAC data, but also tools developed by partners around the world that uh, will, are helpful or hopefully import, important for uh, local uh, urban planners and other decision makers uh, at the local, regional, national level to uh, improve not just the indicator assessment, but decision making related to sustainable development. So uh, that's just my quick overview of how population makes a difference. And knowing where people are is critical to a whole range of different applications. This little cartoon from XKCD that some of you may be familiar with kind of emphasizes the point that uh, we mostly care about things where people live and, and that matters to us the most. Not not that the other planets aren't important, but uh, uh, we are focused on the Earth where we live. Thank you. I'm pleased that following me is Linda Pistolizzi, who's a geographic information specialist uh, here at Season. She'll be telling you more, as I mentioned, about the work we're doing with the uh, indicator 9.1.1 1 .1, focused on uh, rural access to roads. Uh, and then later in the session, uh, my uh, colleague Charles Hike from ImageCat, uh, who is a partner on our Human Planet project, will be talking more about the disaster risk reduction applications of population and building settlement data. Okay, my name is Linda Pistolesi. I'm a senior GIS specialist at Season at Columbia University. Um, and before I get going, I'd like to thank my colleague, Season Research Assistant James Gibson, for his work on this analysis and his help with these slides. So this presentation will focus on how population grids can be used with other types of data to monitor progress towards Sustainable Development Goal 9, specifically SDG Indicator 9.1.1, the Rural Access Index. At the end of this session, you will be able to describe SDG Indicator 9.1.1 and how it is measured, identify the inputs used to calculate the Rural Access Index, or the RAI, explain why the choice of gridded population input can lead to different results for this simple indicator, and recognize the advantages and limitations of using currently available open global data sources to calculate the RAI. Sustainable Development Goal 9 aims to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. As part of Target 9.1, the development of a quality, reliable, and resilient transport network falls under this goal. Good transport connectivity supports inclusive and sustained economic growth and social well-being by facilitating access to local, regional, or global markets, as well as access to social and administrative services. SDG Indicator 9.1.1, commonly known as the Rural Access Index, or RAI, was proposed and accepted as an indicator to measure this target by measuring the proportion of a country's rural population that lives within two kilometers walking distance of an all season road. This distance, two kilometers, is estimated as equivalent to a walking distance or a walking time of 20 to 25 minutes. And an all season road is a road that is passable year round by typical means of transport. The Rural Access Index was developed by the World Bank Transport Unit 
and presented in their 2006 technical paper, Rural Access Index, a Key Development Indicator. The report states, the Rural Access Index provides a consistent basis for estimating the proportion of the rural population which has adequate access to the transport system. It can help to inform policies and strategies which ensure that the rewards of development are distributed more equitably to the rural population. The report identified two main approaches to measuring the index. The preferred approach was the use of household surveys that include questions about access to transport, as this approach can capture how such access relates to household characteristics such as income and access to services such as health facilities. The alternative was the use of map data, specifically GIS methods and model estimations, to determine the number of people living within the specified catchments of the road network. Based on the methods in this report, the RAI was computed for 173 countries at the national level only using mainly household survey data. Surveys are costly and time consuming and conducted about every three years, which limits the frequency of RAI updates for monitoring progress. This is particularly relevant at the subnational level because widespread local investment in or neglect of the rural road network can result in more rapid improvements or deterioration at that scale. In 2016, the World Bank published an update to their RAI methodology that takes advantage of the increasing availability of GIS data and technologies, including remote sensing, GPS, crowdsourcing, and open data. This new GIS method is based on three sets of geospatial data that provide information on where people live, the spatial distribution of the road network, and road quality. Using the new geospatial approach, the RAI can be computed by GIS software. In place of survey data, the World Bank is now mainly using high resolution gridded population distribution data developed by the research community to capture where the people are. This is because most countries don't have in-house high resolution gridded population data. World POP's 100 meter gridded data product is the population data set used by the World Bank to compute the RAI. The population data are then restricted to rural areas of national and or subnational administrative units using boundary and urban rural data sets. The administrative boundary data is always official or national data, while the urban rural designation is preferentially the national definition and seasons Grump Urban Extents data set when the national data are unavailable. Digitized road network data are increasingly available from national road agencies, but where a national source is lacking, global public domain and commercial data sets like OSM and DeLorme respectively are used instead. Conceptually, the methodology is still focused on access to an all season road, However, recognizing that not all official road data sets have road condition information, substitutions are sometimes made using technically more objective common parameters, such as roughness of the road, as measured by the International Roughness Index, and the Pavement Condition Index, which is based on visual assessment. The combined road information is used to estimate the rural population within two kilometers of an all-season road. These inputs are combined in the GIS software to estimate the rural population with access to all season roads. This estimate is divided by the total rural population to get the proportion of the rural population with access to all season roads. The RAI is often multiplied by 100 to present the results as a percent rather than a proportion. The World Bank's geospatial methodology is more cost effective and sustainable than the original method as it no longer as it is no longer dependent on survey coverage and frequency. The geospatial method can also be applied more consistently across countries than the survey based method, even though the quality of official geospatial inputs may vary by country. This method also allows for RAI estimation at the subnational level, such as districts or villages which can highlight significant inequality in rural accessibility across areas, aiding prioritization of road improvements and monitoring. Thus, the geospatial RAI has become the most widely accepted metric 
for assessing rural populations' access to transport consistently across countries and time. The World Bank has computed the RAI for 25 countries so far with this new geospatial methodology. As part of the Human Planet initial initiative to operationalize the SDGs, CSEN proposed to use this, a standard set of global open geospatial data sets to calculate the RAI for every country rather than relying on official, official national data inputs. The World Bank favors official national data when available, which may produce the most accurate results for the country, but which can limit cross-country comparison and lengthen the frequency of updates. We see several advantages to a global open data approach. The use of common inputs for every country enables better cross-country comparison. By standardizing the inputs, we are able to script the processing workflow, making it easily repeatable with minimal person hours to produce updates. This also supports the possibility of an RAI time series using updated versions of the same inputs. So our model for the global open data approach is very similar to the World Bank model presented earlier. Our inputs are gridded population estimates, national and subnational administrative boundaries and rural areas. And for our all season roads data, we relied on a single data set rather than separate data sets of road network and road condition since no global data set exists for the latter. The Python script processed the inputs and calculated the RAI. In the next few slides, I'll discuss the inputs and processing in more detail. Recognizing that there are many gridded population products available to users, we ran the analysis with three different data sets and compared the results between data sets. The data products we selected are the Global Human Settlement Population Layer for year 2015, or GHS POP, the World POP data set for year 2019, or WP, the High Resolution Settlement Layer for year 2015, or HRSL. Each of these gridded population products are produced by members of the POP Grid Collaborative, and all the data sets are viewable in the POP Grid viewer shown previously in this webinar. The three data sets differ in their inputs, the degree of modeling to produce them, as well as in their cell size or resolution. GHS POP is a lightly modeled product that allocates census population to Landsat-derived built-up areas. It is available at 250 meter and one kilometer resolutions. We used the one kilometer version. The World POP dataset is a highly modeled product which uses a random forest model and dasymmetric redistribu redistribution to allocate census population to grid cells based on statistical weighting of covariate layers such as urban extents, land cover, roads, etc. It's available at 100 meters and one kilometer resolution. We use the one kilometer version for ease of processing and comparison with GHS POP. HRSL is another lightly modeled product that allocates census population to satellite-derived settlement extents defined by the presence of buildings in high-resolution imagery. HRSL is only available at 30-meter resolution, and while it will eventually be a global data set, it is currently available for only 179 countries. Each of these data sets uses a different methodology to define settled areas and allocate population to those areas. The database of global administrative areas, or GATAM, is the source for our national and subnational administrative data inputs. GATAM is a high resolution database of country administrative areas compiled from spatial databases provided by national governments, NGOs, and from maps and lists of names available on the internet, for example, from Wikipedia. Data are available in several formats, including shapefile, and are freely available for academic use and other non-commercial use. By using a standard data set for administrative boundaries, we eliminate the concern for discrepancies between international boundaries that can occur when using official national boundary data sets.
The Global Human Settlement Layers Settlement Model, or GHS SMOD, is the source of our rural areas input. The model is based on population density, counts from GHS POP, and satellite-derived built-up areas and provide the standard definition of rural areas across countries. This is important because the criteria used to define urban and rural areas can vary greatly by country and impact cross-country comparisons based on those definitions. The source of our roads input is OpenStreetMap, or OSM. The data are available as global downloads in geopackage format from osmdata.xyz. Using a global roads input provides a common road classification across countries, which supports cross-country comparisons. Since the global geopackage format can be a challenge to work with due to its less common file format and its size, I want to mention an alternative source of OSM data. Geofabric, a German company that extracts, selects, and processes free geospatial data into more user-friendly formats, provides OSM country-level extracts in the familiar shapefile format. We opted for the OSM data.xyz product for several reasons. To run the analysis globally and with the hope to complete a time series, the global geo package extract made the most sense because we didn't have to download data individually for every country. It also includes all of the geometry and attributes for the primary OSM feature, in our case, highways, whereas Geofabric provides a selection of features and their attributes. The Geopackage also has a universal timestamp for the entire global extract, rather than a different timestamp for each country level Geofabric download. As mentioned previously, there is no global data set of road condition information. In order to define all season roads, we use the F class attribute in the OSM data, which represents the functional class of the road. While it is more an indication of the importance of the road rather than condition of the road, we use it here as a proxy, as did the World Bank for three countries for which they used OSM data. This table shows the five OSM F classes that the World Bank included in their definition of all season roads for those three countries for which they used OSM data. Our visual inspection of roads in imagery during our pilot run with Nigeria, Colombia, and Spain indicated that four additional F classes quite often looked to be in good condition, though there was variability between countries. We decided to expand the definition of all season roads to include these four and ran the analysis with both definitions so we could compare results. Once the full suite of input global open data sets was prepared, we composed a script to automate the RAI calculation country by country. The basic workflow is presented here, though there are some steps omitted for simplicity. It starts with dissolving the global GATAM data to layers of admin 0 and admin 2 for each country. Note that the admin 0 layers are used throughout the workflow to make country selections from the remaining data inputs. Here, Nigeria is used as an example. The global SMOD data is converted to Polygon and only the rural areas extracted for each country. The global roads data are filtered to include only the desired set of roads for the World Bank and season definitions of all, all season roads. Then they are buffered and all buffers dissolved into a single multi-part polygon. This polygon then represents the area within two kilometers of an all season road. The next step is the creation of the zone layers for the zonal statistics operation to estimate the rural population within two kilometers of an all season road. The intersect tool is used to isolate the overlapping features of the admin two layer, rural areas layer, and the road buffer layer, thus creating features representing rural road buffers for each admin two unit. At this point, a layer for rural admin two areas is also created so that the total rural population of each admin two unit can be calculated and plugged into the final RAI formula. 
Next, the three gridded population layers are clipped to the GAD admin zero extent. And finally, zonal statistics are calculated using the admin two rural road buffer zones and the gridded population data to get the total rural population in each admin two unit with access to an all season road. To calculate the RAI, we simply plug in the output from zonal statistics into the equation, noting that the total rural pop was also calculated previously. As a proof of concept, CSEN computed the RAI for Spain, Nigeria, and Colombia using global data methodology just described. The results showed that while the counts of rural population differed greatly, as seen in columns two and four, especially between HRSL and GHS POP, the RAIs were remarkably consistent regardless of the population input. Possible explanation for this discrepancy is that GHS POP allocates population only to areas defined as built up areas and therefore tends to underestimate the total rural population. HRSL by comparison allocates population evenly to pixels identified as having buildings regardless of the number or size of buildings. Therefore, it may potentially overestimate rural population or under, underestimate urban population, depending on the level of detail of the census population inputs. These differences appear to be moot once proportions are calculated, resulting in consistent RAI results. We also tested Nigeria using two different OSM road selections and saw the first indication of how different the results could be depending on which F classes were included in the definition. Adding just one additional F class, unclassified roads, resulted in a difference in the RAI of about 25%. Continuing with Nigeria as an example, here we see the subnational RAI results from our final analysis using the three POP layers, GHS, HRSL, and World POP, and the season definition of all season, all season roads in the top row of maps, and the World Bank definition of all season roads in the bottom row of maps. Comparing national REI results across POP layers, GHS and HRSL produced similar results, with World POP having slightly lower results regardless of the road definition used. However, we can see that spatial patterns, while broadly similar, do have significant differences. GHS and HRSL show greater subnational heterogeneity, whereas wall pop results show large, cl large clusters of admin two units with similar RAI values, particularly in the wall pop results computed with the World Bank roads definition in the bottom right. This feature of the wall pop results may be a consequence of roads being included as a covariate in the model and therefore more population being allocated to areas with high densities of roads. As with the pilot work, we see that using a more inclusive definition of all season roads produces REIs that are consistently 25 percentage points above results obtained with the less inclusive World Bank definition, regardless of the population layer used. Just to note that in this slide and all the other maps in this presentation, gray units had either no rural population with which to calculate the RAI, or the RAI results were greater than 100, which is an error. Looking at the national level RAI results using the more inclusive season roads definition, we again see relatively similar patterns regardless of POP input but more quantitatively similar results for GHS and HRSL as compared to World Pop. The same similarities hold true for national level RAI results using the more restrictive World Bank definition of roads, though overall the RAI results are lower. At the subnational level, using Africa as an example, here with season's more inclusive roads definition, we see a rather dramatic difference between the world pop results and the other two data sets, especially in areas of the Sahara. These lower RAI values are likely due to the world pop model, which does not predict zero population values in any pixel. Rural areas with population in administrative units are assigned a small per pixel population estimate. 
This adds up over large, likely uninhabited areas like the Sahara, resulting potentially in overestimation of the rural population without access to roads. The spatial patterns in the Africa subnational RAIs using the less inclusive World Bank roads definition show similar pa spatial patterns to the previous maps. And as with the Nigeria and national examples, the REI values are consistently lower. <clears throat> Looking at the preliminary global average results for our RAI analysis, we see that season's more inclusive selection of all season roads results in global average RAIs that are consistently about 10%, 10 percentage points greater than the averages computed with the World Bank definition of roads. This indicates that a better understanding of the correspondence between OSM F class and road condition, as well as a better global road condition data set, would help the analysis. For both definitions of all season roads, GHS and HRSL averages are con generally consistent with each other and about eight percentage points higher than the world pop results. This is consistent with world pop often predicting lower RAIs for a given unit, likely due to the manner in which the model allocates population in large rural areas. We are still working on this analysis and waiting for final results for some countries and hope to conduct more assessment of our results against the current World Bank results. As we come to the end of the presentation, I would like to discuss some limitations of the global open data approach. With regard to gridded population data sets, there are several to choose from, each with their own biases and frequency of updates. With regard to the global boundary data set by GATAM, the boundary resolution and quality varies by country, and its handling of disputed areas is not transparent. In addition, the update schedule for GATAM is unpredictable. But despite these issues, at this time, GATAM appears to be the best open global national boundary data set. With regard to defining rural areas, SMOD may not align with the national definition of rural areas, which are used for policy and resource decisions. And in terms of roads data, as a crowdsourced data set, OSM quality and coverage can vary by country, especially in rural areas. The data set also has limited road condition information, and using the F class as a proxy requires further refinement. Finally, the data set is not associated with government responsibility and therefore can't really be used for prioritizing road improvements. In the global approach, the accuracy of the RAI ultimately depends on the quality of the OSM roads data for a given country. Let's review. SDG indicator 9.1.1, the Rural Access Index, or RAI, measures rural access to all season roads. RAI can be effectively calculated by combining geospatial data for administrative units, rural areas, roads, and population. While there are advantages to using global data sets, such as standard inputs, automation, and temporal comparisons, there are also limitations. The choice of pop grid data set and OSM road selections significantly impact RAI results calculated using this method. But ultimately, this is a simple and effective method for monitoring RAI globally. For this presentation, we um, accessed the following references as well as, and we've included the data sources here as well. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to introduce the next speaker, my colleague Charles Hike from ImageCat. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Charles Hike from ImageCat. I'm going to be talking about work that we do there using population data to develop building exposure databases for the purposes of looking at the impacts of disasters. This work has been funded uh, through a number of research grants, uh, primarily recently through the UK Space Agency and their International Partnership Program, 
Project Meteor, led by um, British Geological Survey. There's been a number of uh, rounds of funding from NASA Disasters Program, including one now looking at critical infrastructure and, of course, the Human Planet Project that we've been working on with CSUN. So in this presentation today, I'll uh, assume that most of you are coming to the table with minimal experience with the subject of CAT modeling and loss estimation, CAT standing for catastrophe. So I'll give you an introduction of the, the area, try to give you an understanding of um, uh, what the data sets are used for, what the accuracy of the data sets is, um, and then give you an understanding of the value of EO data in this process and understanding, uh, you know, at, once the results are, are developed, what the uncertainty is that's inherent in the results and what the appropriate use of those results are for decision making. So loss estimation or catastrophe modeling um, is the, the process of estimating what might happen given a certain uh, excitation from a natural um, disaster. So if you've got a hurricane, tornado, uh, earthquake, um, we predict what might happen if before an event. So for example, if you were to look at a large, uh, large earthquakes that might hit Los Angeles in a, in a, in a planning capacity, uh, during event, as or as it sort of uh, uh, unfolds, so this would be in circumstances like where you have a hurricane uh, approaching the coast and you want to uh, understand what the evacuation might be or what uh, the staging resources might be given different uh, instances of how uh, landfall might occur. Uh, and then uh, on average, so using a what's called an event catalog, looking at uh, thousands, sometimes millions of events, uh, trying to characterize uh, the, everything that might happen and how likely we think that might be to happen. Um, so many storms, many fires, uh, many earthquakes, uh, looking at on average um, uh, what, what happens in any given year. And that can be used um, for cost benefit analysis purposes to evaluate the uh, cost efficacy of mitigation options, for example, or it can be used to price insurance or to understand our relative risks of various hazards uh, and so on. So first, uh, taking a look at what building exposure for DRR or disaster risk reduction is. Most of you are familiar, I'm sure, with these type of renderings, architectural renderings of, of buildings that are used uh, for multiple purposes, from, from entertainment to, to planning and so on. This is most decidedly not what we're, we're looking at when we're talking about building exposure data. What we're talking about really is a very specialized product that's used uh, in conjunction with uh, what we call hazard and vulnerability data to be able to find uh, the risk of a given hazard throughout an area or a given peril throughout an area. So in this context, the hazard is um, the manifestation or the potential manifestation of the natural hazard that we're looking at, whether it be flood, earthquake, wind, tornado, uh, sea level rise, coastal hazards, or whatever. Uh, the vulnerability uh, in this context is um, what we uh, sometimes refer to as a damage function, which will indicate what the likely damage to um, a given uh, asset or infrastructure asset is given that hazard. So for example, uh, how much damage you would expect to have a, uh, from a house if it had a, a foot of water in it versus two feet of water in it versus a wave hitting it uh, or, or what have you. Um, the damage uh, can be expressed in terms of a percent of the uh, total value. It can be expressed in terms of um, a dollar value uh, for uh, estimated repair cost, or it can be expressed in terms of um, uh, days down um, or or potential uh, cascading impacts that might might have. But uh, in all these uh, circumstances, you have to have a, an understanding of the exposed uh, assets that uh, the the assets exposed to the hazard and the vulnerability. That's why we call it exposure. Uh, and in this context, what we are talking about is an estimate of the building exposure. Uh, as opposed to um, populations, vulnerable populations, um, critical infrastructure, or what have you. So we're really talking about uh, the built environment and more specifically buildings themselves. 
So here's an example posted by um, the GEM Foundation, uh, that's Global Earthquake Model Foundation uh, in Italy that produces open um, models, earthquake models for um, the entire world. Uh, they've uh, served the data that we've come up with in the media project, which is data for about 47 countries. And here you can see um, most of Africa and a, a gridded data set there that's at the 15 arc sec second resolution. And for each grid cell there, if you click on it, you get uh, the answers up here on the right, which is essentially uh, what the value of the exposed buildings are in, in dollars, uh, what the area is in square meters, uh, what the building count is, um, of course, what the location is, and then how those um, assets, those buildings break out by uh, construction type. And here we have some codes uh, which map to um, specific vulnerability functions or damage functions that will estimate given amount of um, peak ground acceleration typically or, or ground motion um, what they expect the damage to those facilities to be. So for example here we've got W that's uh, simply wood frame uh, and then several other codes that map directly to, to construction types. So very specifically uh, what, what's in these building exposure databases is the number of buildings, where, by type, and cost for the purposes of estimating vulnerability and hazard proximity. So here we have four very, very different uh, types of buildings that you would expect to find in four very different uh, locations that are more or less uh, resilient to various hazards that might be in their environment. So what we're trying to figure out is, given all these four types of buildings, uh, which ones are, are uh, most vulnerable to wind, earthquake, uh, flooding, and then uh, under those conditions, what you can expect to, to have happen regionally um, to get a, a, a dollar value for, say, disaster response, um, um, mitigation, um, a real-time uh, action, and so on. So how we develop these building exposure databases, um, in the first place, we collect census data, the most accurate census data that we can. Um, given the uh, level of, uh, of detail uh, justified by the project. So if, if you can get a micro census data, if that's available, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, sometimes we go to um, a country and get the census data that's available uh, from them, download it uh, on a vector basis. Um, and oftentimes we, we just uh, default to a land scan or a world pop database. So within the, the, the census, we, we look at the census data to see if there's any indications of a building construction pattern. Sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. Um, but the next step is to essentially estimate the building attributes shown in the previous slide. Uh, how are people living where? Uh, and to refine the spatial distribution. So this is the sort of disymmetric mapping process that WorldPOP might do. Uh, when taking uh, census data and uh, and disaggregating it to um, to a grid basis, uh, we need to do that as well. Um, but taking into consideration uh, the building types themselves, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, estimate the number of buildings. That can be as simple as looking at the uh, number of people and the number of people per household and estimating the number of households and then estimating the number of buildings from that. But um, you can also adjust that regionally based on what um, building patterns that you're seeing in an area. And then last is uh, to estimate the replacement value, which can be um, uh, quite difficult um, given, given um, um, development practices in, in various countries and even what's meant by replacement value. Uh, essentially, um, the uh, damage functions themselves, or vulnerability functions, will give you an estimate of the percent damage typically, and you multiply that replacement value. So um, what, you dis what your client, what the end user wants that replacement value to be, whether it's depreciated to a current value or um, takes into account permitting or, or architectural costs is, is essentially up to them. But um, regardless, what we come up with uh, working uh, with folks is the uh, estimated replacement cost per square meter that we multiply out by that, um, ultimately that, um, that estimated amount of building stock. And in there between that, those two phases, of course, is uh, estimating the uh, average square footage of each of those buildings. And that too can vary by, by the types of uh, areas that you have. 
So drilling down into each one of those steps with a little bit more detail, uh, estimating building attributes. Um, we start with a literature review of the predominant building construction types for, for a country. Sometimes there's reports specifically for this type of uh, application that have been written, um, you know, Google, just going to Google Scholar or uh, World Housing Encyclopedia from ERI is a great resource for this. Um, uh, USGS Pager has sort of a first guess for, um, for the entire world. Uh, interpretation of EO data uh, right off the bat, taking a look at uh, what the patterns, the development patterns are, how those look by different sort of types of land use that you can see in uh, high resolution satellite data, for example. Uh, expert opinion, um, depending on how much detail um, and money you have to develop a specific uh, country or area of interest building exposure data, you might uh, interview uh, many experts that would be able to inform how typically how buildings have changed throughout um, uh, the last couple decades. And you can use that in conjunction sometimes with EO data to, to characterize uh, different vulnerability patterns and different building patterns. Uh, virtual reconnaissance, this is the process of really looking at a lot of street view data uh, where that data is available. It's very good for engineers to drill down. And even if you don't have um, uh, street view data, you can have in situ photographs, tourist photographs, all that type of stuff that do capture buildings um, will allow you to, to get a, uh, an understanding of how buildings are made in different environments. Um, and if you, um, if you do have a budget that will justify it, site surveys and stratified sampling, I'll get into the idea of the, the strata a little bit later, but uh, looking at different development patterns in urban environments, rural environments, um, single family uh, environments, if those are, are, are around, and figuring out what the typical um, breakout of different construction patterns for each of those types of environments uh, can be done through a randomized sampling process, which we, we like to do if we've uh, got budget for it. And then lastly, again, the housing census, sometimes uh, separate from the population census, will have uh, in many countries whether you have what the, the roof, wall, and ceiling materials are. And from that, um, you, can, you can often infer the construction uh, of the building. Another important step is estimating the number and size of buildings um, by, by development pattern or sometimes a region of the, of the country. This is simply the process of, of taking the, the estimate of um, how buildings are made and what you can see in the EO data uh, and how many people there are in a, in a given area and then estimating from that what you would expect the number of buildings uh, and ultimately the size in terms of square meters of building area. Uh, livable building area that you would have, uh, and, which, and that typically um, varies by something uh, we call development pattern, which I'll get into a little bit later, but, you know, urbanity, um, uh, uh, rural, urban, and, and so forth. Um, so uh, people per household and households per building, as I, as I discussed later, is the, the simplest way to do it, but that often um, uh, leads a lot of error, particularly if you only have the a number of people per household at the national level. It can vary significantly based on um, even, even in the rural environment uh, in a given country, depending on, um, on you know, cultural differences or, or climate differences and, and this type of thing. So being able to calibrate that, your estimate of the number of buildings and the size of the buildings with uh, building footprint data is, is very uh, useful. Um, if you've got OSM data, for example, you can take samples of that um, and estimate your building counts um, well count the buildings, footprints available in the imagery, and then compare that to your estimates. That's a, a great way to, um, to calibrate it. And you can, again, do that against uh, other types of EO data, uh, for example, SAR data, and then use that SAR data to, to estimate a um, uh, number of buildings and, uh, or, or square, square meter coverage directly from that, that attribute. Um, Microcensus or government reports so will often give you more detail on um, number of households per building that you can adjust regionally uh, if you can't get the, that in the raw census data. Um, a distribution of building area by story height. So this is uh, story height might not be something that you can directly um, get from EO data at the level that we're really talking about it. You know, we're not talking about developing per building data here. It's aggregate data. Um, but you can come up with a distribution perhaps from uh, the sampling process or 
a uh, interpretation process and then from that um, estimate the uh, total building area. Uh, and of course, these things uh, vary by population density, as I said, urbanity or um, EO metrics like the SAR will sometimes correlate highly with these, these attributes. So estimate of replacement value. Um, as I said, this can, can be uh, a, a little ambiguous in terms of whether you depreciate the data or what's included in, in the replacement value itself. But even uh, a, um, a crude estimate can be very, very difficult to, um, to gather. And believe it or not, this is, uh, this is an area that uh, we found that EO can be quite helpful. Um, so uh, there are international guidebooks in terms of how to do this. We've got some of them here. Spons, for example, is a, a very popular one. There are estimates um, that are based, um, are available globally. For example, what GARC has put together on global um, death damage functions, their document has an estimate uh, based on uh, uh, simply on, on GDP alone as a fu function of GDP, which is a nice sort of first guess. Um, but uh, what we find is that the value really, um, the replacement cost value really varies by um, the rigor of construction. And the rigor construction itself um, is often, can often be uh, guessed or characterized by, um, by development patterns in the EO data. So if you've got rural areas, you often have much less rigorous construction, uh, what we would call temporary housing or semi-permanent um, housing. Uh, and in the urban areas, you're much more likely to have permanent housing. Uh, so that alone can be a, a very strong indicator of what the replacement cost is. We've found that um, uh, resettlement action plans that are um, that are available, that's essentially uh, if they're building a, a roadway or a big dam and they have to acquire um, a property um, and have people uh, move out of the way for the for them to, to build that those that infrastructure. Uh, they've got a negotiated price that they they will pay for those um, that those properties and and the relocation, and we find that that's a very very strong indicator of um, of what the replacement cost is and allows us to to essentially characterize the replacement cost uh, of those less rigorous um, um, temporary housing um, as a as a percentage of of the um, of the of the permanent housing in the in the country. So uh, estimating replacement value is an area that's that's often sort of overlooked. Um, it's uh, but it's you know if you're off by um, fifty percent, which is I think pretty easy to do, then your loss estimates are going to be off by by fifty percent because a direct I'll correlate to your to your answers and uh, there's a lot more room there than in the in the damage function. So these in terms of the absolute value, not the distribution, but in terms of the absolute value can can really uh, impact your results. All right, building vulnerability attributes. So these are the attributes of the buildings themselves that can be um, uh, directly mapped to uh, a damage function that allows you to estimate the, um, the, the damage given, say, um, um, depth of flooding in meters, as we've got here on the, uh, on the right. So this is a, an example of various damage functions based on, um, for flooding, based on different uh, rigors of construction. Here we just have abstract names, but the one that's on the top there, you would expect to see more damage. Um, and so it's a less resilient structure than you've got on the, on the bottom, the purple, which wouldn't have, you know, at uh, uh, one and a half meters of flooding, an estimate of 40% uh, damage. So these can be uh, extraordinarily rigorous. Um, there's uh, tens of thousands of combinations of them that, uh, that have been put together um, to estimate what the damage for what the vulnerability for, for specific buildings are. Obviously, when you're putting together um, a um, building exposure database for uh, the national level, um, uh, for example, you wouldn't have that much detail. This is a detail that's more suitable for if you are having an engineer um, go out and look at specific um, buildings or, or even designing specific buildings. But, um, you know, you kind of do what you can. You, you pick through and you figure out what you think is necessary. Um, here are, the, um, uh, here are uh, some of the things that, that uh, people consider. Era of development. Um, this is particularly important when you're looking at um, countries where they have rigorous building codes and uh, adhere to those building codes and 
the codes have changed um, throughout the decades based on um, often um, significant events. So for an example, in the United States and the Southeast, you've got um, residential construction uh, changing in terms of its vulnerability to hurricanes significantly following significant events. A uh, number of stories is a, is a, a key, um, key value in terms of uh, the uh, resonating frequency of ground motion for earthquakes or in terms of the, the wind profile. A first floor elevation, that's how much that first floor is above um, uh, ground level. Um, you, if you've got a crawl space in there, for example, or if you've actually built the building with what's called freeboard or built it on stilts to, um, to avoid a flood, that's a very important metric for flooding. Um, the basic construction materials, lateral force resisting system, uh, that's uh, for earthquake, uh, whether the, something has been retrofitted, nail density is a big one for, for hurricanes, uh, which obviously you can't see from, uh, from the sky. Um, so uh, what the best you can do is be able to tie these back things to things that you can uh, essentially see and characterize uh, regionally. Uh, if you've got specific data, um, as you often do for the United States, you can, you can use that. But um, for EO-based exposure development, looking particularly for the international community, um, what we can do is essentially come up with development patterns, characterize where um, you have what types of collections of buildings, and then uh, take the, the key salient um, exposure um, uh, building characteristics uh, from those uh, and be able to, to characterize uh, the percentage of buildings that are in each of those bins. And typically what you want is between, um, you know, five and 10 uh, combinations of all of these categories. It's very easy to get um, uh, more combinations of these uh, construction types than you do buildings. Uh, which um, can be quite problematic if you're trying to to distribute them and, and figure out what the losses are. So um, it's a it's a constant um, a balance between uh, engineering rigor and reasonable statistical practice. Um, um, but um, we do what we can. So hopefully that um, sets up the problem uh, pretty well. Um, finally, we get to the, the um, directly to the subject of what does what role does EO play uh, in all of this? So first of all, those global population data sets, um, particularly um, uh, internationally, are very important because then we can just sort of uh, piggyback off of all of the, um, the great work that others have done on trying to uh, disymmetrically or realistically estimate uh, populations and then use that as a starting point to uh, estimate the number of buildings. Um, global urban slash rural or urban intensity data sets that are starting to um, come, come together like uh, GUF and GHSL and, and so forth are, are, are very useful. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, well, Seg next segmentation of development patterns. So um, what we can do is um, try to look at sort of uh, the texture, if you will, of buildings in a given area to, um, to infer not necessarily land use, but um, building um, pattern uh, extraction. So where you've got different types of building patterns corresponds um, um, pretty directly, um, depending on the country, to uh, the way that people are building buildings. Um, building footprint extraction uh, to get the estimate of the building area, uh, average building size um, of that. And then um, um, another uh, area that's exciting is looking at AI from things like video people trying to extract things like um, uh, window area, um, presence of soft story buildings, um, uh, first floor elevation, and various attributes from um, directly from street-based video data or uh, ground-based LIDAR instruments or UAV data or these type of uh, sensors um, basically allows you to um, uh, sidestep the process of, um, of well, not of, sending a, of, of, of conducting a survey uh, and directly uh, take those attributes from, from data that's collecting on, collected on the ground without having that engineering experience on the ground. All of this is, um, is pretty much, I would say, in its research phase, but promises if you were able to harness that type of ground-based data, then we can combine that ground view with the sky view, if you will, to develop a building exposure databases. 
So building footprint extraction, uh, most of you are probably familiar with um, this um, technology um, and you're probably familiar with uh, how it often doesn't work. Um, you know, you can try to square off buildings. Um, sometimes you, you get uh, more buildings than you, you anticipated. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, and trying to make sense of that can be uh, problematic. But I would posit for this application, um, where you you don't really care um, how many buildings you have, the number of buildings, as much as you do um, the square footage of those build or square meters of those buildings, because that's what directly correlates to uh, the replacement cost and the ultimate damage. Um, what you get from uh, from EO data is um, is very handy. Um, that said. It's uh, a pretty um, intensive process in terms of, um, of area. You don't typically get it for, for very wide areas, when, at least when we do this type of work. Um, it, so it, we use it um, often in terms of a sampling um, um, technique. But with, um, with the Bing data sets and the Facebook uh, HRSL data sets, it's now becoming more, and reason, more and reasonable to um, apply that uh, nationwide in certain, certain circumstances. So that's, uh, that's quite exciting. What you need to, to uh, watch out for, however, is that when you don't have that data, um, uh, for example, in, in India, we were looking at the HRSL data and we did not have it for um, uh, Calcutta, I believe, um, but we had it for the rest of, of India. And it's very easy to uh, aggregate that data up or make assumptions with it and then um, say, um, uh, forego uh, one of the largest cities in, the, in, a, in a country and then have a very skewed look at risk. So whatever you want to do, you want to make sure that you, you sample from a statistically robust perspective um, if you don't have it for everywhere. And even if you do have it for everywhere, you have to make sure that, it's, uh, that, that you're comfortable that it will do consistently well everywhere. But um, that being said, it's a, it's a very, very good resource um, to nail down uh, exactly um, uh, how much building value is exposed. So this is more typically how we use it, uh, not for an entire country, but uh, looking at specific uh, areas, um, just uh, going through and extracting the, the building count and building area for different types of, of, of construction um, and different um, uh, types of, um, of development patterns and in, in different types of countries. So, uh, you know, you, you, you can uh, understand certainly how this rural residential, high density residential might be easy to distinguish uh, in, in remote sensing uh, imagery. And then once you have those, those areas, being able to have an estimated count uh, average, square, average square meters um, um, and, uh, and total building area by multiplying by the number of um, uh, average number of stories in those types of grids uh, would, would really work for sampling strategy when you're trying to um, infer the number of, uh, well, the, the ultimate building area from the population. So the process of establishing these development patterns and then extracting them through segmentation is uh, really quite iterative um, and works better in some places than, than others. So this is a nice uh, crisp example, I guess I would say, um, in China, you had uh, mid-rise mid residential construction, which all looked um, a specific way until a certain date where it all looked at a different way. Uh, and you could really tell by the density of these uh, mid-rise residential structures and heights, and you could really uh, look at the difference between these, what was it, the six-story buildings and the 12-story buildings, for example. But for each of those, you, um, you can have an engineer um, establish what uh, the construction pattern is in those uh, areas or what the what these buildings are made of and map that directly to um, to a vulnerability function. Now they're not usually this um, clean um, you don't usually have one building pattern per, per um, or one building type per development pattern. Uh, usually you have a you know an array of them that, that you'd uh, characterize but this um, this illustrates the process of having you know, engineers look at what's on the ground and talk to um, the uh, remote sensing folks to figure out you know, what they can reasonably extract, what you can see in the imagery, what you can't, and then sort of um, uh, triangulate in on, on what's a reasonable development pattern to have for your area of interest, which we typically establish at the country level.
So here's an example of what that looks like um, for a, a small chunk of Beijing. You can see um, from the shadows um, a pretty consistent uh, building and elevation for these uh, dense residential areas. And, and it's clear to see where you've got some of the older parts of the of the city uh, that's that's all uh, low rise as well as um, the uh, intersecting um, uh, uh, industrial buildings and infrastructure and what have you. Um, so we run our classification algorithms over there. Um, and uh, as you would imagine, they're not perfect, um, but we um, they're OK. This is a um, uh, this is the result of running the analysis at the pixel level. And I believe this is a Landsat data or, or, or moderate resolution data. And you can get you, you can see quite a bit of scatter uh, in the initial classification. And then what we do is aggregate that up um, to a larger scale where you've identified, uh, um, you, you know, you filtered out some of that noise and identified in, from a um, a statistical approach, what the development pattern is, and then you can start to um, associate with each of those uh, what um, the breakout of, of, of building types would be. So the question of what to, um, which to use of those last two slides, uh, for example, the higher resolution uh, data or the um, or an aggregated aggregated form of it uh, is a is a big sort of uh, of question and I think it it depends uh, largely on what uh, what peril you're looking at and uh, and how you're using the data so if you're giving the data to a client uh, aggregating that data up where that noise is, is sort of um, smoothed over if you will um, at the at the cell level um, and the numbers you, you you're working with the low the law of large numbers and you're more likely to be accurate in terms of a given 100 meter or 500 meter square area how many buildings that you would expect to be in there in that area you're going to be much more accurate for that than you are going to be at the uh, say 15 meter uh, level that being said um, if your peril is highly localized um, such as looking at landslide risk uh, coastal risk or, um, or or riverine flood flood risk, for example, having that higher resolution data and maybe not posting uh, the number of buildings at that cell level, but using that as a basis to um, statistically internal to the, the program, uh, estimate what the losses are, I think can give you a more accurate result because in these circumstances, um, uh, you know, location is everything. Um, probably even more important than, than the structure types. So if you've got the sinuous rivers, as you actually do running here, you're not going to be pixelating them. Um, uh, you, know, you, you will have a little of, a, of that apparent noise visible, but you'd be able to um, identify with more accuracy if you've got an inundation area, what the expected surface area of, in this case, Beijing, you would expect to be covered by that, by that peril. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a... Um, uh, a, a detail that uh, I think that this crowd could probably appreciate uh, more than than most, um, but it has a lot. To, it's a it's a big question in terms of uh, sacrificing um, the um, uh, accuracy of what you post and put out there versus the accuracy of the result that you get from the model. And just to sort of complete the story here, um, this is for another country, but um, for each of those those colors that you're able to, or these development patterns that you're able to identify, which in the colors in the last um, maps of Beijing, uh, you, you're able to map that back to specific uh, distribution. So I, I made the example there of the uh, mid-rise residential structures uh, in China, um, but this would be more um, what you would see for, from a development pattern uh, typically, which would give you, um, you know, the percentage of buildings uh, that you would expect in a, um, uh, a cluster of maybe uh, five to ten types. So here we've got steel high rise on the left, steel mid rise going down to steel low rise, then reinforced concrete mid rise and reinforced concrete low rise, uh, and, and moving to the right to all the way to stone snow mortar and URM stands for unreinforced masonry. So you can see as you've got these rural and residential greens and blues, you have a quite a bit more over here to the right, which is less uh, rigorous construction. And as you have these um, reds, uh, oranges, and yellows, you have 
um, more of the steel frame and reinforced concrete uh, structures. So this uh, plays out uh, for each of those cells to be able to classify and break out the structure um, types into these classes for the purposes of the vulnerability functions really gives you a much more accurate estimate of what your losses are. So the question that um, um, most people have, or they should have after uh, seeing, uh, hearing this uh, pitch, if you will, is how good is this stuff? You know, uh, particularly if you've got people that are thinking about, well, we've got building specific data, uh, why not just use that? Well, you don't typically have building uh, specific data uh, for an entire country. Um, sometimes you do. Uh, and then in those cases, maybe you can use that and buy that. Um, but even under the, uh, those circumstances, you're going to have error as associated with your model. And it's important to understand what the uncertainty is based on that uh, that's introduced uh, by this process. I would say traditionally um, uh, in the field of exposure development, particularly in the United States, people have said, well, you've got the law of large numbers uh, working uh, in your advance. And the law of large numbers is, you know, you may be um, a little off here and a little off there when you're looking at particular assets. Uh, but on average, uh, you should uh, you should uh, zero in on 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 a pretty good representation of the of, of the overall situation. But that simply doesn't account for um, for bias, right? If you've if if you've got uh, error in in terms of uh, individual um, uh, interpretations of assets, that's probably pretty good. If you're trying to to estimate uh, what the uh, total building value of buildings in Tanzania is based on uh, average uh, people per household data, that you've got one number for the whole country. Then you've got significant bias, and you're going to you're going to be off in those those types of uh, of calculations. So one of the things that we tried to do uh, on the Meteor project is to um, a come up with uh, various levels of of building exposure database to characterize how the building um, um, buildings were developed to communicate, and then uh, after that to um, assess what the um, what the uncertainty was by running uh, all of them through a full probabilistic mo um, a model for Los Angeles, which we had in our back pocket, uh, and see what the uncertainty is. So really quickly, these five different levels. Uh, uh, number one is a global level. You can consider this like a, the land scanner world pipe type of database. Level two is a national database. In this case, it was um, a HAZUS database, which uses all federal level data. A level three is Im improved uh, national level data considering regional um, um, adjustments to key indicators. You can see it's a little different than two. That's where we used some of our um, uh, EO secret sauce. Level four, you can immediately see it's almost as if the exposure comes into focus. That's um, where you skip to building specific um, data that's actually um, aggregated in this case up from Microsoft Office building footprints. And level five is where you've got building specific data itself and run all of that through the data. In this case, it's um, a Los Angeles County tax assessor data. So what, uh, what we're trying to say, this is called an EP curve. Um, and on the bottom here, uh, we've got um, years of a return interval. Uh, and on the, on the y-axis, we have the um, uh, dollar value in loss, essentially. Uh, what nobody knows is how much um, inherent exposure data or error is there in the process of developing exposure data. Um, as a rule, you use the best exposure data that you have and you develop the, base, the, the best database that you, you have. Nobody had uh, really compared um, different methods of developing building exposure data and look at uh, the amount of uncertainty introduced by that building exposure data um, process itself. Um, uh, people look at a lot uh, at, uh, at various hazard data sets uh, and vulnerability curves and the impact of those, um, but uh, exposure is, uh, was not looked at in a, such a rigorous manner. And what we found was, uh, was uh, not entirely surprising. The spread in the various databases that, that we put together for Los Angeles uh, was about a factor of two, a little more than a factor of two. Um, but the interesting thing is that it didn't sort of monotonically increase um, towards uh, the middle or the top or the bottom. It did not, it was not a matter of the more accurate data, 
that you integrated into the process, the more accurate of a result that you got. So for example, here level five, which is that Los Angeles uh, County tax assessors data is on the bottom. And level four, which is um, with Microsoft building uh, footprints is uh, on the top and with the level three in the middle being the, um, the stuff that we did with the EO data. A little above that is um, the uh, has us data and then uh, level one, which was the global data um, uh, down there by the uh, Los Angeles tax assessor database. So the um, uh, as we drilled down into those different uh, answers and had some independent uh, review uh, from engineers, we did a sampling to, to figure out what we really felt like the uh, risk was and what the answer should be. Um, and what we found was it was right, it, it was uh, right there in the middle about uh, level, level three, but the factors that were, um, that were resulting in um, uh, the distribution that we saw uh, were all, um, all attributable to a key factors um, that uh, in the end affect um, uh, the dollar value per, um, the, the dollar value of the area. Uh, and they, these are very, very uh, simple. Uh, I've said them all uh, already here before. The persons per household, uh, the living area per household, the rebuilding cost, and in, as we've seen internationally, exchange rates, which didn't um, um, apply to Los Angeles, but it's been a very important one. Uh, the focus, I think, is uh, is often on vulnerability or geographic resolution of, of the exposure data sets, but these these key factors and I, you know, I could go through if you're interested. Contact me of, of each of those those five and 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 uh, iterate why there's there was a considerable um, variation. Um, just one um, highlight: the Los Angeles County Tax Assessor data was systematically sort of uh, underestimating the building exposure value because they don't have uh, government buildings for one. Uh, for uh, another uh, Prop 13 uh, law here, where in California where we don't uh, reassess the building value for tax. Um, purposes unless it changes hands. So um, these, these kind of systematic biases can really uh, affect your, your, your final results, uh, even more than the, the, the data that you use um, from a geographic standpoint. So that being said, uh, bringing it back to um, uh, the uh, population data sets directly, here's some research that was done by Cascade um, Tucholsky um, looking at uh, the exposure of various population data sets uh, to uh, ground motion. It's called quake intensity down here. Um, it goes from 6.5 to 8.5. And if you look in aggregate um, at the number, at the population exposed to uh, each of the, the bins in here, you'll see that um, it doesn't vary that much uh, over the, the level of about uh, 7.5. And if, if you were to look at the aggregate results, this is a case where the law of law number, large numbers really does um, probably um, uh, uh, wash out the, uh, the differences in the results. I'm sure that um, if we tied a loss model to this, and I would like to work with Cascade to do that, we would find, um, we would find variation that was far below um, the 2.5 that we found uh, for a probabilistic uh, loss analysis uh, in Los Angeles, even though these results might look quite different. And um, the folks in the audience that might have been involved in putting these uh, together would be would be surprised to hear me say that. Um, but because the vulnerability, particularly in this case, uh, might not vary significantly um, uh, uh, throughout the area, um, the, these results are uh, as a uh, as a person involved in loss uh, estimation and cap modeling for 25 years. Uh, does not um, does not surprise me, and um, I would be very satisfied to be able to have uh, these type of answers come back for an international event and use that for decision making. So, in essence, this does get back to the nature of the of the peril, however. So, if um, uh, getting back to the more accurate um, uh, aggregated results that you might have uh, are are nice for earthquakes and hurricanes. The higher resolution uh, for floods, landslides. Um, uh, it's, it's probably um, uh, much more appropriate, uh, but again, that's uh, difficult data to, to um, distribute um, because at the, at the cell level, and there might be just so much variation and um, people would uh, uh, be very tempted to repurpose that data. So having that built into a model might be uh, a more reasonable way to use it. So this brings me um, to um, a very important point that I'm, I'm, I constantly have to sort of reinforce. Um, 
you can't uh, you, you have to uh, address expectations of the client. Um, this data cannot be used to accurately estimate the number of, of buildings at the cell level can't uh, capture very small regions. It, it can't capture things that uh, remote sensing can't capture. Um, settlements are always a challenge uh, and so forth. And to a certain extent, you have to take a uh, take pause and, and remember what you're trying to, to do. Um, if you ask the question, how much does it cost to build this hut, for example, um, uh, on one on one level, it might the answer might be nothing, right? Because uh, this is all indigenous materials, and probably nobody was paid for the labor. So you have to make sure that um, uh, that what you're characterizing is is equitable and answers the questions that you're 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 wanting to um, to to prioritize in a given uh, disaster uh, risk reduction uh, effort, and that is often uh, the number of people exposed and the disruption that you would anticipate. Um, whereas the dollar value might not be a very good uh, indicator of that. You have to make sure that um, that that the uh, amount of buildings exposed or the square footage exposed uh, to a given hazard and what the uh, looking at how that might disrupt the population itself has to be considered um, along with uh, the dollar value. Okay, real quickly here at the end, because uh, I've gone on a little bit too much, uh, inappropriate uses as a, as a cost effective to retrofit specific buildings, which buildings are going to fall down, exactly how many buildings are going to fall down. These are not the type of answers that this type of data can, can uh, adequately uh, reflect. What it can do is tell you, is it, uh, is it cost effective to retrofit certain types of buildings? What might happen given a 100 year flood or a large earthquake or volcano uh, or something has just happened? Um, uh, where should we be sending resources? Uh, where should we be checking for, for damage and, uh, and casualties? Where should we send our search and rescue teams? These larger picture issues are, are much more appropriate. Thank you very much, Charles. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to move right into the question and answer session. Uh, so please type your questions into the Q&A box. Some of the questions that have been asked so far throughout the presentation today, we've been moving over to a Google document and we will start working our way down through those one by one. Okay, welcome to the question and answer session. Uh, we have been diligently trying to address these questions as we've been going along. And uh, we have all the trainers on here to help us out with these. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, please feel free to email me and I can try to redirect that to uh, the trainers on today. Um, but hopefully we can get to them all. Um, so I'm just gonna start off and uh, who is most appropriate to answer the, the questions, please feel free to then unmute and, and hop on. So, uh, so question one, do we have older age over 65 years population of the world, especially as India as a population grid data? Um, so we have, we do have older age gridded data um, as long as there was such an age class in the in the census inputs. So where available, we gridded the data at five year age groups up to 85 plus. Um, and uh, so we do have data available for those years uh, in GPW4 and WorldPOP as well uh, has global age and sex data in five year age groups. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I will post these links into the the question and answer, uh, or excuse me, the, the chat box there. And of course, we will have this available uh, for download with all the links and references available on our training webpage in due time once we sort of clean it up a little bit. But I'll post these here if you want to. Uh, so see the chat for those links. Question two, how did you validate the demographic data with GPW. Uh, I'll take this. Uh, uh, there's some text that uh, shows a method of how we um, took the uh, age category proportions and applied them to uh, uh, the 2010 estimates. 
so these are really estimates uh, the the age totals uh, do add back up to the uh, national uh, level world population prospect estimates, but there's no real detailed validation. Uh, and that's a general issue uh, with all of the population estimates, GPDW and others, which is that these are model estimates of population distribution. And it's actually quite difficult to do what you might consider a full validation, that is comparing the estimates with actual, you know, detailed location data for specific households um, and that have specific demographic characteristics. Those data are very difficult to obtain for the scale we're talking about in all the different countries. Um, uh, they're obviously in private and confidential in, in terms of the willingness of census agencies to share that data. So those kinds of detailed validation studies are, are difficult. And I, I don't think any data set has been fully validated from that viewpoint, uh, although many data sets do attempt to, to see how their models compare with with uh, data on the ground. Thank you, Bob. Uh, question three, and you know, some of these earlier ones came Sorry, a little early. Bob, did we send the... so, yeah. so number three, are these methods available in R for spatial dis disaggregation of counts? Um, uh, I, again, maybe... Sorry, Bob, go ahead. Go ahead, Linda. No, I was going to pass the buck to you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I was just going to say that I personally don't work in R, but yes, there are um, methods available in R to do this type of work. I believe the WorldPOP um, random forest um, algorithm is written in R and, and uses, you know, the packages available there. I don't personally have experience with R, though. Thank yeah, you. we can try and tap one of the other people who, who may have better knowledge about it to provide some more details. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll try to throw a link in here before we post to the training webpage. That'd be great. Uh, what is the best population data set out there suitable for flood mapping in urban coastal cities like Accra uh, versus flood mapping in island countries like Mauritius? which consist of both urban and rural areas. Uh, looking for some key limitations to consider when using the public data set for both cases. Uh, so I'll take a stab at that. Um, uh, you know, the, there's not a simple answer. Uh, different, e even the same data set may have different quality based on the data that they use for a particular country or, or region. Uh, actually, I think the uh, example that Charlie gave um, uh, of, uh, done by Cascade Tuholsky looking at um, the uh, risk uh, differences, uh, you know, indicate that, you know, if you're at a high enough scale, some the data sets may produce similar results. But as you drill down, uh, it's a little hard to tell which is going to be better. We, we uh, are in the middle of a study that's looking at slum areas and we are starting to find that actually all the available data sets may be underestimating um, the number of people actually in the slums uh, but again it, you, you have to take that with a grain of salt because the validation data for slums is itself uh, got problems and you know issues regarding um, those counts. Um, so we did produce the publication that's available on the POP Grid site to try to give uh, guidance on issues and limitations, uh, which can you know cover a range of factors about the different data sets. Um, and uh, we do encourage people to use the POP Grid viewer to 
kind of give you a sense of what the variation is and you can that can maybe help you judge as to whether a data set really uh, uh, is appropriate for your application in your particular area. Great, thank you. And uh, question five, um, it looks like you know, maybe we needed a little bit more expansion on this question, but the question was, what data should I use in a project that involves tea production management? Uh, yeah, and I, I, I wrote this uh, initial answer. Uh, you know, we'd need more specifics about what the question is. Uh, I could imagine that if you're looking at, uh, say, um, who's affected by tea production or pollution, you'd want data that looks at those areas and does a good job um, kind of capturing the residents uh, involved or, or living in the exact area. But if you're looking at markets, uh, you might want to know something about the demography and the uh, you know, uh, type and economic level of populations in cities near there. So uh, it's a little hard to judge what data is appropriate for the project of interest. Great, thank you. And uh, question six, it looks like this user is already working with some WorldPOP data. So I'm currently using WorldPOP raster data to assess the population impacted by gully erosion in, a, in urban areas of the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've noticed that in large cities, the population pixel values are highly differentiated, which is good. While for small affected urban areas, is it op is the opposite and the population is grossly underestimated. Is there a way to overcome this problem? I, mean, I think James and I both wrote a bit of a response here. So um, I'm not, it's not clear, you know, how, um, how the person who wrote the question was addressing um, how they determined that there was this huge underestimation in the urban areas. But there are other, you know, the, the best suggestion would probably be to experiment with some of the other data sets, maybe starting with looking at the pop grid viewer, you know, in those areas and seeing how the other data sets are representing the pop in those urban areas. Um, World Pop provides their data both unconstrained and constrained. Uh, constrained means that they are using a um, a settlement model and only allocating population to areas that are considered settlements, whereas the unconstrained version is allocating population, um, you know, a, without in, without the incorporation of a settlement model. Um, and so, you know, both of these may have different results for how much population is being allocated to urban areas. Um, GHS POP also allocates population um, only to satellite derived built up areas, which may result in more population in those urban areas. So just sort of comparing those different data sets and how they're representing the area that that is of interest would be um, the main suggestion here. I guess I'll um, weigh in on this one because I've found uh, I found this to, to, to be true, really, the, uh, the question. Uh, it's important to recognize that these are global scale data sets. And when you're doing a more um, localized study um, to look at populations affected, for example, by flooding, uh, I think it's important to to uh, adjust and come up with your own um, um, answers that uh, you know identify those smaller seg uh, settlements that are difficult to characterize with moderate resolution data. So it's a, it's a great place to start. But if you're looking at a, a specific uh, area, um, adjusting it is is what you typically need to do. Thank you. And uh, question seven, um, kind of a technical question here. What is the geo package format and what are the merits and demerits, I guess, limitations and strengths? James, maybe you want to chime in since you have the most experience working with that for our project. 
Yeah, so I wrote this little answer. Um, I worked with Jew Package is for the project that Linda presented on the RAI. Um, so it's like an, it's a it's just a, another format for transferring Jew spatial information. Um, it's an it's like an SQL format. So if you're familiar with that, it's pretty easy to use. Um, it in Pro, it, I found it was a little bit difficult to work with, um, but it does, they, they can contain like tons of data and tons of information, which is really great. Um, and I just added that you can work with them in Python using the GeoPandas package. Um, so that can also like help in making it just more, like easier to work with. Thank you very much. Uh, question eight, how do you delineate urban and rural areas? Is there a global acceptable definition for urban and rural areas? Uh, so I, I can feel this one. James and I both contributed to this response, but there, there isn't um, currently, I guess, a standard that is adhered to by all countries, although there is a proposed and accepted by the UN standard uh, for degree of urbanization. Um, and the description is there in the um, in the response. But generally, every country has their own way of defining their urban and rural areas. And so this is an issue for indicators that are based on urban rural delineations. Um, you know, it affects the, the way that we can compare um, each country's results and progress towards the towards the indicators. Um, so that's why uh, global settlement models like GHS SMOD, which we use for the global RAI, um, are helpful because they take a standard approach um, to to defining urban and rural areas uh, globally based on pop counts, densities, and satellite-derived built-up areas. Um, and the SMOD approach or the, the methodology used to produce SMOD is actually or does actually follow the uh, degree of urbanization method, although the final product is provided at a sort of more refined level. So there's um, not just urban and rural areas, but or not just, you know, a limited number of classes, but I think there's something like eight or 13 classes in the SMOD data set, and they can be aggregated to that. Um, degree of urbanization one um, using the the uh, outline in the data set documentation. And I'll just add, uh, as I just typed in, that the uh, uh, accepted degree of urbanization approach was actually developed by the European Commission's Joint Research Center, which is our partner. Uh, under the Geo Human Planet Initiative and uses um, the data that was developed jointly between uh, JRC and CDAC. Great, thank you for adding that as well there, Bob. Uh, question nine, what does the UN adjusted world pop data set mean? Are there other population data sets also UN adjusted? Um, so, UN adjusted means that um, the population totals in the grids. So when we when we first produce the grids, um, we check the population totals for every country against the official UN national totals reported in the World Population Prospects, uh, which comes out every two years. Um, and based on our totals versus the UN totals, we calculate an adjustment factor that is then applied to the population estimates in each grid cell so that the national totals um, in the final grid match the UN totals. And so not all grids are adjusted in this way to match the UN. Um, both GPW and WorldPOP provide the population grids um, either adjusted or not adjusted, and it's usually um, explicit in the data set name whether you're, you know, whether you're downloading a a UN adjusted data set or an unadjusted data set. The unadjusted won't usually say unadjusted, it'll just say population counts or population density, 
but if it's been adjusted to the UN totals, um, it will be explicit in the name. And just to clarify, there are differences in the national totals because the census data that uh, all the georeferenced population data sets are based on may not correspond to the UN year, and we have to do simple extrapolations to get the data to be consistent. And, the, and those adjustments mean there can be differences between what po the UN population prospects thinks is the national total and what, what our data say is based on the original census data. So that's where you get why you get differences that need to be corrected. Great, thank you. Question 10, do you have any examples of using gridded population data to assess damage, disaster damage or risk and its impact by gender? I guess maybe I'll go ahead and uh, um, start with this one since it was uh, asked during um, my session, although I'm not sure my answer is, uh, is the best one. Uh, you know, for the, the analysis that we typically do, um, we use demographic data to estimate what's going on with buildings. And then um, once we analyze what's going on with buildings, we sometimes then look at things such as uh, casualties and injuries, uh, and that can be uh, applied back to, to the um, uh, impacts to, to populations in general. So uh, it's not used directly in the assessment that, that, that we've done, although sometimes afterwards, if you look at things like building damage, um, and um, gender ratios and, uh, and uh, working um, relationships and so forth. Uh, uh, people do use that to make conclusions uh, for response, um, but it's not something that I've seen done uh, directly a lot at, uh, at the development phase. And I guess there are some examples on CDAC if someone wants to take that part of the answer. Right, uh, I, I put that in, I, I just, uh, one of the things that I'd like to see more of is uh, people using the citations database to actually try to find relevant information for questions like this. So if you actually go to the database and uh, you can see which entries uh, cite a particular data set, so I you can actually click the GPW version for collection and then within that collect, uh, pick the two data sets, revision 10 and revision 11, of basic demographic characteristics that has the age and gender breakdowns for 2010. And when you search on that, you actually find 15 citations. And, uh, you know, the database doesn't contain the full paper. It only contains the titles and basic info citation information. Uh, but reading it, there's like, four or five, five papers that specifically mention heat waves, tornadoes, floods, air quality, and COVID. Um, so I don't know if the papers actually look at a gender, you'd have to read them, uh, but at least it gives you a starting point to find out if anybody has actually done a, a detailed analysis of uh, gender uh, using these, um, you know, uh, disaggregated population data. Okay, thanks. Okay, question 11, and um, looks like this is about exposure data, so possibly this is for you here, Charlie. Uh, is there a foundation of buildings considered to come up with the building exposure information? Well, you know, as I <clears throat> expressed, there, you can develop the building exposure data at, at many different scales, but um, for this sort of aggregated view in general, you sort of want to get um, the factors that are are most directly applicable to the peril that you're you're trying to analyze. Uh, I have seen um, well frequently uh, first floor elevation can be very important when estimating damage from flooding. So in that case, the foundation is considered a bit, um, but um, for earthquake hazards and most flood applications, what you typically see is people looking at the roof material, uh, floor material, floor material, roof material, wall material to to, to infer um, um, a structural class, and it can be some. It's used in the context of that, but typically not 
um, uh, directly. Some folks that are doing uh, more detailed analysis will try to infer what's called secondary indicators, um, which can include foundation type uh, if they've got a damage function that directly relates to it, but in general it might be too much detail. And uh, question 12, the real earth, uh, is there the real earth surface slope land cover considered to buffer the distance of two kilometers of all season roads? And it looks like this is for you, uh, Linda and James. Um, sure, so I'll take it. Uh, we, there isn't currently, um, well, we didn't use that for the global analysis because there currently isn't a global road condition data set, which is what getting at the real earth surface, um, you know, the road condition information is what is trying to get at the real earth surface to determine whether the road is, you know, passable all year round. Um, so we just use a buffer distance and try to get at this question of all season roads using the F class attribute in the OSM data um, as a proxy. And that really needs a bit further refinement. Um, the F class attribute can vary a lot, um, you know, country to country. Um, for how it's been applied can vary a lot. I should say the attribute itself is, you know, has a definition, but um, how it's applied country to country can vary. So this is part of the global analysis that, that could be refined. Great, and um, before I move on to question 13, I just wanna mention a, a couple things. I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, we can take a couple more questions and then address the other questions offline and get this posted in the future. Um, I really leave that up. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so if there's trainers that need to drop off, that's understandable. If any of the participants want to drop off, if you have other things to do, please feel free. I also want to note that the homework is now available under part two on the training webpage that is due by the 27th of April. It's a Google form submission. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, if there are trainers that need to drop off, go ahead. Um, but um, maybe we'll take just a couple more. Uh, yeah, Brock, I'm a, I think most of the rest of them are for me. I'll, I can take the, um, I can stay on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we won't go too much past the hour, but uh, let's uh, okay. uh, address a couple more of these audibly. So, uh, question 13 Can a type of dwelling unit be used as a proxy for poverty levels in developing nations? You know, I thought this was a great question. Um, uh, we generally sort of think of it, I think, the opposite um, uh, way. When we look at these development patterns, you can definitely see what we call the durability of the structures, um, which is a direct correlate with with poverty, which, um, you know, we know we use that to um, estimate the fragility of the, uh, of the structures as well as the replacement cost. Um, we are, um, but we, we haven't thought about using that as a direct indicator of, of, of poverty for, for other purposes. Uh, much. That being said, <clears throat> on the Human Planet Project, we have started talking with, um, uh, through the introduction of Bob Chen, to um, a group, um, I think they're called uh, Idea Maps. Is that right, Bob? Uh, that is starting to look at the characterization yeah. of um, uh, deprivation areas. Um, you know, and in that specific case, we, we think that there might be um, uh, quite a bit to uh, to uh, uh, contribute. So we are we are sort of looking into that, or beginning to look into that, and I, I think that there's a lot of um, a potential there. Great, thanks, Charlie. Fourteen. Which resource do you recommend for imperviousness density, and how to obtain it from any U.S. environmental gov agency? Uh, Bob, you want to take this one? I guess there is, there is some data on the CDAC site. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I was I wasn't totally clear if the person was looking for impervious surface area. Um, there was a study uh, done a few years ago by uh, some NASA Goddard scientists 
using Landsat data to uh, model impervious surfaces as a as a factor in also defining urban areas. So uh, that data set, uh, 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 GMIS, is available on our site uh, at that link. It's actually an interactive viewer, so you can uh, visualize and download the data since it's at 30 meter resolution. Great, thank you. Yeah, and that that surface area, impervious surface area uh, data set also um, use it applicable to um, in SDG 1131. Um, question 15, are these algorithms open code? If yes, where can we access them? And I'll post this URL in the chat. Yeah, I, um, you know, we are a commercial company, so we don't um, uh, publish our, our algorithms. That said, it's, it's really more of a art than a science. Uh, you know, each each project, you know, really requires its own um, assessment of the the area that you're developing at the scale that, um, you know, what's changed. Uh, things change quite quickly in terms of data availability and, and so on. Uh, that, that we also try to um, uh, make it very clear what we do and how we do it. Um, you know, we're very transparent in that regard um, with the um, metadata so that people can can go in and update or augment the data for their own purposes. Um, but yeah, I would uh, recommend anybody who's interested to really check out the Meteor project where we've got 47 countries of worth of this data to download and play with. Great, great resource to have. Uh, question 16, how can we identify uh, persons in a household through EO data? Yeah, um, I mean, really what we, the reason we, I, I keep focusing on the persons per household is because it's, uh, in most cases, what you're doing is you're going from a population estimate to an estimate of the number of households to the estimate of the number of buildings. So obviously, persons per household is a key uh, determining factor. You can't actually infer that from uh, the EO data uh, itself, or I don't know how to do that. Um, uh, but you use that in, in trying to estimate how many buildings that you're uh, going to effectively spread. And then when you check that, you can check that with other data sets that are EO based and, and figure out where your answer is wrong, where you don't have essentially enough buildings based on either what you've been able to extract with building footprints. And then you essentially adjust after the fact. Great. Uh, so question 17, as buildings are very uh, heterogeneous in nature and their unit replacement costs varies a lot depending on spatial location. What do you think should be the factor delineating the areas that can be considered to have similar unit rates for replacement cost? Yeah, I could talk about this for several hours. So <laughs> I, I think that the, the, the important, um, I mean, it, it gets to the nub of the matter. I, I think the Im important um, thing is, is to keep in mind that you're really trying to characterize um, the, um, the majority of buildings. Um, if, if you have too many forks in your statistical model um, you know, that, that to break out from each individual cell, for example, then you, you quickly get to a condition where you've got more forks than buildings. Uh, and uh, when you start to run a Monte Carlo analysis, for example, it, it, um, it, you're just generating noise. So I, I always sort of think if there's less than 5%, it's not worth uh, characterizing. And if you've got any sort of special uh, structure in terms of, um, uh, you know, a sports stadium or, um, uh, you know, elaborate mosques or these kind of things. It's it's important to, um, if you do address them, address them on a, a point basis. So hopefully that that answers the question. Um, feel free to reach out to me if um, if you'd like to, uh, to discuss it. It's an excellent question. Uh, question 18. My question is, how do we deal best with different resolutions of ancillary variables vis-a-vis -vis population gridded data? Yeah, I don't think there's any easy uh, answer to that question. Um, it's uh, you know, just ba basically a, it's a data fusion process. Uh, anything that you've got in terms of observation or um, a microcensus data, uh, you have to um, uh, be very careful to um, integrate in a way that you don't introduce any sort of bias. Um, you know, if you have a detailed data in one location but not another that's very similar, and you integrate it for the place that uh, that you have the data, then you're going to come up with an answer that skews your answer of risk either towards or away from um, a, a, the other 
community uh, and in a disaster that's going to affect the distribution of aid. So you, have, you need to be very careful about it. Um, and, uh, you know, what we found is using these sort of uh, similar development patterns is the best way to, to um, uh, assure that you don't do that or, or guard against it. Great, and thank you. Bob, I, I added a sentence because uh, uh, I'm not totally sure what the person means by dealing with the resolutions. It's really, uh, you know, from our viewpoint, the issue is the population, the gridded population data based only on, say, census doesn't give you a good understanding of, of uh, population spatial variations that really fine scales. So the ancillary data that's available at finer scales is really the tool by which you try to infer or model those uh, variations. Now, they hopefully that they add useful high resolution information that improves your estimates. There's no guarantee of that. So, you know, what what Charlie just said about it being an art and and uh, needing to be uh, adjusted based on the development pattern, I think is is really useful. But it, it's really a, a feature of what we're doing of trying to uh, meld data of different uh, resolution and scale to make a better estimate that's useful for researcher applications. Great, thank you. So we have two questions left. I think we can get through this one. And really the number 19, is there data available for um, island on Haiti? And it looks like uh, the link here to the Meteor Project is here and that there is data available. Um, so I'll just move on to question 10. Uh, I just want to make sure I you make sure I correctly understand one can simply add its own particular data to PopGrid and perform analysis. Um, one could exchange data, let's say replace WPP data with their own personal estimates. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So uh, I wasn't sure if if uh, the person. Uh, since I didn't talk about it briefly, but it was talked in the first session, the, the PopGrid viewer uh, just allows a user to draw a polygon or a circle or some other area. And then for that area, just get uh, what the total population is in that area uh, for all the different georeference data sets. Um, so it doesn't allow any further analysis. Uh, if someone has their own census data, uh, and wants to grid it, they would at present need to, you know, put that in a GIS and apply an algorithm. Like, or I think it was alluded to before. Are there tools in R and other languages to to do gridding? Uh, uh, you know, those are available, but there's no online service to do that. Um, although we've actually talked about it and thought about what other functions one could perform over the internet, such as letting people upload data and then using the population data to help them weight, create weighted averages, those sorts of things. At the moment, uh, all one can really do is get a custom estimate of, of uh, extract of the population data summed to a user-defined area. Hey, thanks, Bob. Um, that's a good clarification there. Um, so that brings us to the end of our Q&A session, and it also brings us to the end of our two-part training. So um, I will have this video available for you to review on your own time within about 24 hours. And the homework, as I mentioned before, is also there. And we'll get the Q&A docs up, uh, all cleaned up with the appropriate links uh, as soon as possible for you to use as a resource. So I just wanna say to Linda, James, Bob, Charles, uh, thank you very much for uh, this Q&A session here today and for part two. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Okay, great. Have a great week. Thank you.